So I would like to officially welcome you to this webinar as Registered Nurses Association of Ontario introduces to you our newest best practice guideline supporting adults who anticipate or live with an ostomy second edition. So this guideline was published this past uh, spring and it is a revision and replaces the 2009 ostomy care and management best practice guideline. Today's webinar will be presented by the RNAO team who led this guideline. Uh, so just to introduce myself, my name is Nafsen and I am a guideline development methodologist as well as the guideline lead for this best practice guideline. Um, I'm a nurse by background and have been very fortunate to work on this meaningful project. I worked alongside my colleague, guideline development methodologist, Grishma Jacob, who you will hear from today, as well as Glynis Gittens, who was the project coordinator for this guideline. Uh, Glynis is not here with us today. However, she did play an instrumental role in the guideline. Uh, instead, we do have Erica, who is another project coordinator, supporting us today. Uh, and, and her full name is Erica D'Souza, I should mention. Uh, we are also very fortunate to have with us today our two expert panel co-chairs who will help lead this guideline. That is Dr. Christine Murphy and Dr. Kimberly LeBlanc. Dr. Christine Murphy serves as the president of the Wound, Ostomy and Continence Nurses Canada organization, also known as ANZWA Canada, uh, supporting wound, ostomy and continence education programs to over 600 nurses nationally. She is also an advanced wound nurse clinician at the Ottawa Hospital and an adjunct assistant professor at Western University for the graduate wound program. Dr. Kimberly LeBlanc is an NSWAC as well and an adjunct professor at Western University. Dr. Kim LeBlanc has been a nurse educator for over 18 years and is the chair of the Wound Ostomy and Continence Institute. I just want to extend my gratitude on behalf of Arneo for their guidance throughout this entire BPG process, and we are so delighted to have them join us today. I would also like to thank the greater Arneo team that was involved in bringing this guideline to life, and we have their names listed on this slide. So in terms of the objective of this webinar today, uh, we will be describing components of the guideline development process, including the systematic reviews, which was really the foundation to the best practice recommendations. We'll also be highlighting all guideline recommendations, and we'll be providing an overview of RNA resources to support the implementation and evaluation of this guideline. So who is RNAO? RNAO is a professional association of registered nurses, nurse practitioners, and nursing students in Ontario, Canada. Uh, since 1925, RNAO has advocated for healthy public policy, promoted excellence in nursing practice, increased nurses' contribution to shaping the healthcare system, and influenced decisions that affect nurses and the public they serve. Our best practice guideline is the signature program of RNAO. Though we are a nursing organization, our guideline uh, program acknowledges that healthcare is provided within an interprofessional context, and therefore our guidelines are made with the intention that members of the interprofessional team will also use them. In terms of the guideline itself, um, if you are looking for it online, you can go to the RNAO website and download an electronic copy for free. If you would like to purchase the guideline, you can also email us by clicking on the on the contact us link at the top right of this screen that we have a snippet of. So with the guideline, we have also published some supplementary information. So this includes materials to make our processes as transparent as possible. So this includes our guideline and systematic review search strategies, evidence profiles, which are tables outlining details of the content and quality of the studies that we appraise to inform recommendations, as well as the panel declaration of competing interests. In addition, we also have a document that outlines how recommendations in the previous edition of the guideline compared to the new edition. In this document, we have outlined practice recommendations from the first edition of the guideline and where relevant information can be found in this new edition of the guideline. So you might find this quite helpful if you are uh, used to using the previous edition of the guideline. We would also like to acknowledge the tremendous experts and guidance of our expert panel in the development of this BPG before we move forward. Uh, so their names are listed on this slide. 
Uh, the panel was in fact committed to this project over the span of a year and a half and provided critical oversight and support. The expert panel consisted of a variety of ostomy experts, including persons with lived experience, NSWOX, social worker, dietitian, surgeon, just to name a few. The panel represented a variety of healthcare sectors, including home care, acute care, rehabilitation, uh, just to name a few of the sectors that, that were with us. Uh, this here is an, is an image of our amazing panel without whom this guideline would not have been possible. And we are ever so grateful for their engagement and contributions. Um, prior to publication of the guideline, we had 21 stakeholders review it. And I'd like to acknowledge them in this slide and the next. Their names can also be found within the guideline itself. So what was the purpose of the guideline? The purpose of this guideline was really to provide nurses and members of the interprofessional team with evidence-based recommendations for the most effective strategies to support adults, so those that are 18 and older who anticipate or live with an ostomy that would promote self-management, enhance access and delivery of care, and lead to positive health outcomes in, in adults who anticipate or live with an ostomy. So this, the purpose of the guideline was um, determined in consensus with our expert panel members. The recommendations in the guideline are also directed towards educators, leaders, policymakers, as well as researchers. Uh, one key concept within this guideline was that it recognizes adults who anticipate or live with an ostomy and their support network as experts in their health and decision making. And that collaboration among the interprofessional team the person anticipating or living with an ostomy and their support network, if needed, therefore essential, is essential for achieving improved health outcomes. And this concept was continuously embedded throughout the entire guideline. In terms of the scope of the guideline, uh, the guideline addresses the most common types of ostomy, including colostomy, ileostomy, and urostomy. So this is very similar to the first edition of the guideline. And this guideline is applicable to all healthcare settings across uh, all settings across the continuum of care for persons living with or anticipating an ostomy, including acute care, rehabilitation, community, and primary care, just to name a couple of examples. So, in terms of the recommendations themselves, uh, the recommendations in this guideline reflect topic areas that the expert panel prioritized based on the current need for guidance in clinical practice and in greater health organizations as a whole. The strategy is distinct from the first edition of the guideline in that we ask specific and targeted questions in effort to provide specific and targeted best practice recommendations. This also reflects a new and more rigorous standard of guideline development process that RNEO has adopted to meet international standards. And this is referred to as grade and grade CERPOL. Um, my colleague Grishma will speak to this methodology in a little bit in the next slide. So for this guideline, the expert panel agreed upon four areas of critical importance on whether or not um, Evidence supports the benefits of access to nurses specialized in wound ostomy and continence, whether or not the literature supports the use of standardized ostomy care programs within organizations, guidance from the literature on prevention strategies for peristomal hernias, and the need for quality of life assessments among persons who anticipate or live with an ostomy. The panel was also asked to prioritize specific outcomes that we wanted to see as a result of each intervention or practice area. Some pra Prioritized outcomes in this guideline uh, included looking at hospital readmission rates, length of stay, quality of life, and uh, the reduction of complications such as peristomal dermatitis, ostomy leakage, hernia development, just to name a few. Uh, so I'm just going to pass it over to my colleague Grishma to speak a little bit more about our guideline development process. Hi everyone, this is Grishma. So as Napson um, mentioned in the previous slide, the expert panel um, prioritized four recommendation questions for this guideline. So here at RNAO, we follow the GRADE and GRADE CERCLA methodologies to develop our guidelines. GRADE stands for Grading of Recommendations, Assessment, Development, Evaluation, and Evaluation. And GRADE CERCLA stands for Confidence in the Evidence of Reviews from Qualitative Research. 
So the main difference between GRADE and GRADE CERQUAL is that GRADE is used to appraise the quality of research evidence from quantitative studies, while GRADE CERQUAL is used to appraise the quality of evidence from qualitative studies. So what you also see in this slide is a PRISMA flowchart that indicates the rigorous process for the systematic reviews we conducted for the four uh, questions combined. As you see on top, across the four recommendation questions, we had 16,233 records. So Navsin and I screened through these records independently and included relevant studies that answered our recommendation questions. And the quality of those studies were then appraised using validated tools. And at the end, we had a total of 36 studies as final includes across all four research questions. So in the next few slides, I'll explain how to read the components of the recommendations within the guideline. And then in the next few slides you see are really a snippet of how the recommendations look uh, like in the guideline. So um, to begin with, for each recommendation, you'll see the recommendation question on top that the expert panel prioritized. Following the recommendation question, you'll see the outcomes that were prioritized by the expert panel to address the recommendation question. So it's important to note that when screening the studies, we only include studies that address the outcomes prioritized by the panel, and all other studies we exclude. And following the outcomes, you'll see the recommendation box, which outlines four components, the recommendation statement itself, the strength of the recommendation, certainty of the evidence of effects, and the confidence in effects, in evidence. So strength of the recommendation is determined by the expert panel to be strong or conditional based on multiple factors, and a 70% consensus vote among panel members is required to determine the strength. Certainty in evidence of effects, it refers to the quality of the quantitative studies included, while confidence in evidence refers to the quality of qualitative studies included. So following the recommendation box, you'll find the discussion of evidence for each recommendation. And the discussion of evidence includes six components, and I'll explain each of these in a bit more detail. So the first component of the discussion of evidence is benefits and harms. So in simple terms, this section highlights the benefits of using the intervention on prioritized outcomes for individuals. This section also identifies if any harms were indicated in studies as a result of using the intervention. The second component is values and preferences. Values and preferences highlights the impact of intervention on health outcomes from a person-centered perspective. And the third component is health equity, and it highlights the impact of a specified intervention on health equity across populations. So a study that indicates access to health services would be an example. In addition to evidence from included studies, the section on health equity may also include insights from expert panel members. The fourth component is expert panel justification on recommendation, and it provides rationale for expert panel's decision regarding the strength of the recommendation. So more specifically, this section details why the panel decided to vote the strength of the recommendation to be strong or conditional. Following the panel justification section, you'll see the fifth component of the discussion of evidence, which is called the practice notes. And this section includes pragmatic information on how to conduct the intervention. And this information can come from the evidence as well as from the expert panel. The final and the sixth component of the discussion of evidence is the supporting resources. And it includes relevant resources such as websites, links, tools, et cetera, related to the intervention in general. So that sort of concludes the overview on how to read the recommendations. So now I'm gonna pass um, it over to Kim, our co-chair, to go over the first four recommendation statements itself. So Kim, um, if you can just please unmute yourself before speaking, that would be great. Great. Thank you so much. I'd like to start by thanking the RNAO and your whole team, Najma and Grishma and everybody else, for all the hard work that you've done on this. It was such a wonderful process, and I really thoroughly enjoyed being a part of it, and I'm so thrilled with the document, the, the final product. I think it's something that's very user-friendly that we're going to be able to use to implement into our practices and certainly into our education as well. 
So I have the pleasure of uh, talking to you first about the first couple of recommendations. And the first recommendation is that health service organizations provide access to NSWACs as an essential members of the interprofessional team for all persons who anticipate or live with an ostomy. And you can find this on page 26. And this actually has a profound impact for patients. We felt that it was a very, should be a strong recommendation. And, you know, some of the things that we know from the literature is that having access to an NSWOC in many cases may reduce the incidence of peristomal dermatitis or skin irritation. And we see that admission rates to hospital, those readmission rates due to leakage or peristomal complications or stromal complications can, can really be re, um, reduced. Uh, as well as there's lots of indications to show the studies to produce that NSWOCs may improve quality of life. And for those of us who work in the field, we see time and time again where this does happen. So it's wonderful to see this in writing and that it's as a strong recommendation. And, uh, you know, obviously it's also very important to note that there is no harms identified, meaning that there is no downside for healthcare uh, providers to provide access to an NSWOC. There is no downside to that. And that, you know, the recommendation was that NSWOCs or um, really provide a, a key or key membership to that interprofessional team and that we work in collaboration. Can I have the next slide, please? So recommendation 1.2 really goes into a little bit more in depth, including that access to NSWOCs includes the following support within the ostomy care continuum. So it's really recognizing that we follow patients across the continuum from that preoperative phase where we're doing stoma site marking and how that can really snowball and affect the individual's quality of life as they move forward. And that really by doing that preoperative stoma site marking, we're setting the stage, including the, peri uh, the perioperative education and counseling, and then providing ongoing follow-up and consultation and management and really involving persons who anticipate or live with an ostomy and their support network and care as is appropriate. And you can find more about this on page 29. And the strength of this recommendation is strong. And I have to say that I met someone in my clinic just on Thursday who came into my ostomy clinic and they really, um, you know, talked about how uh, they didn't know how they would have survived if it wasn't for the team of NSWOCs who's followed them from the preoperative phase through, you know, including their diagnosis of cancer, their need for an ostomy, their post-operative care, and here two years out as they had problems still being able to come back in. So I think that having this as a strong recommendation is very valuable. Can I have the next slide, please? So there's some great practice parallels to having this access to an NSWOC. So, you know, we, we see that the key intervention is that we are there to perform the preoperative stomacyte marking and that this should be something that, has, um, that patients have access to, as well as making sure that they get that pre perioperative education and counseling. And you can look more in detail this to look at the evidence within the guidelines that really show, describe how these different um, interventions and uh, emotional support is needed. Can I have the next slide, please? So the second recommendation really looks at implementation of a standardized ostomy care program using an interprofessional approach. And you can find this on page 35. And I'm also really happy to see that this came across as a strong recommendation. And really this talks, this takes it away from just the ends blocks, but really looks at the hospital setting, the community, and beyond to look at making sure that there's ostomy care product uh, programs in place. And there's a benefit to it in that we know that ostomy care programs may reduce hospital length of stay and the 30 day readmission rate, and that we're going to improve patient satisfaction. And given the rising costs on our healthcare system, particularly the cost of hospitalizing someone and the costs of the emergency departments, it's really imperative that we put these kind of programs in place, which will reduce hospital length of stay and readmissions. So we know that if we look at 
for a practice note, any ostomy care program um, should be developed and implemented by an interprofessional team of ostomy care experts that are unique to each organization. So what we mean by that is depending on where you where you work will depend on which interprofessional team has to be part of that program. If you're in acute care, it may include an ENSWOC, a dietitian, the surgeons, a social work, uh, physical therapist, an occupational therapist, and th those players may be slightly different in the community or in long-term care or in a rehab center. So you really need to look to see who you need to have as part of the individualized team for that patient. Can I have the next slide, please? So recommendation 2.2 looks at the health service organization should include the following interventions in an ostomy care program. So this includes that there should be preoperative education and counseling on surgery, on surgery, daily living, self-care, kind of what can they expect? And we know that patients don't retain a lot before surgery, which is why they need to have a program in place where they can keep going for that information over and over again. We know that post-operative education should include stoma self-management and the troubleshooting for potential complications. We need to look at discharge planning from hospitals, and this is based on readiness criteria, including follow-up information. And this really falls through to the home care and long-term care as well. As we're moving towards people towards um, independence, we will eventually discharge them from our service with the idea that they have a door open for follow-ups. We need to make sure that they have scheduled home visits and telephone follow-ups within the first four weeks. And this is imperative because the things change so much in those four, four, first four weeks after surgery. And access to ENDS walks perioperatively and ongoing basis as needed. So we need to make sure that we always have, those patients have access for the education and the support to hopefully diminish complications. And once again, the strength of this re recommendation was strong. Can I have the next slide, please? So if we look at the, what are some of the practice perils from this, is that we really need to be looking at providing perioperative education and counseling on stoma surgery, daily living, and self-care. And this includes explaining what these um, counseling, what types of surgery they're going to have, uh, the, the hands-on part about the physically, how do I change my pouch? How do I empty it? How do I troubleshoot? How much, you know, understanding how diet interfluences their, their output. Um, really, these are things that are, have a huge impact on quality of life. Um, patients are so scared going into surgeries, so making sure they understand the procedure, they've seen pictures of what a stoma is, like linking them up to a support network beforehand if possible, <laughs> trying to diminish some of their their fears, you know, talking about the impact of the stoma on relationships, sexuality, going to the gym, showering, just activities of daily living, looking at their post-operative routines, and really going through practice sessions and trying to diminish and give them some control back and hopefully reduce some of their anxiety. Post-operatively, we need to carry on with these, these um, education because we know they're not going to remember a lot of what we told them before. So we really need to look to that post-operative period. We need to look at a discharge plan. We need to make sure that we've gone over all the information again, lots of practice sessions, and really be there to answer a lot of their questions. And sometimes it's a matter of bringing up the hard topics such as sexuality or returning to, to, to their regular routines as well and making sure, it's particularly for patients who have an ileostomy, that they're safe to go home in terms of they have the knowledge to be able to deal with um, intake and output and, and knowing how, how to monitor for dehydration and food blockage. And making sure that there are follow-ups for these individuals at home that we can get home care in. And I think this is, you know, with this strong recommendation, this is where we need to take this document and we need to go to the LIN and the health minister and really advocate to make sure that patients don't lose this valuable time at home with the NSWOCs in the community. Have the next slide, please. So thank you so much, Kim, for the overview of the first four recommendations. I'm just going to now uh, pass it over to Christine to speak to the next uh, recommendation. So Christine, if you could please unmute yourself. 
Well, uh, thank you, Kim, my co-chair, uh, who I had the pleasure of working with for so many months on this document. Thank you to the rest of the panel who worked so hard on this, and especially thank you to RNA, RNAO, uh, Nafsim and Grishma and their team. Uh, you wouldn't believe the amount of work they got done in such a short amount of time. So I also am very, very pleased to have had this experience and, and honored to be here today. Um, I will carry on with recommendation 3.1 parastomal hernia prevention strategies. And the strength of this recommendation we found is conditional. Now, um, you may well be aware that parastomal hernia is a common complication after uh, ostomy surgery because uh, you're making a hole basically in the muscle that protects the bowel in order to bring the stoma through. And so this puts people at high risk. However, Many patients uh, are not aware that there are things they can do to prevent uh, this complication from occurring. So it is something to be highlighted. And some of the strategies, conduct a risk factor assessment related to BMI and waist circumference, um, because we know that that is, is, adds to the risk. Uh, to provide expert advice on weight management as needed. And that expert advice may be in the form of a dietitian or someone who is able to give them the proper information uh, that is needed. Um, perform stoma marking preoperatively because where things are located within the, the muscle band properly uh, is going to reduce the likelihood of parastomal hernia. So it's very important to have a proper site marking done. And to provide post-operative education related to things like heavy lifting, and maybe this education is the most important of all of these things. Um, consideration of lightweight support garments, which will have to be properly fitted, so they'll need access to that person, a proper fitter. And abdominal exercises beginning within three months of surgery, uh, as recommended by their surgeon, because people do heal at different rates, and that should be determined for sure by their surgeon. Can I have the next slide, please? So some practice notes on this. Providing uh, instructions on the abdominal exercises to begin with three months of surgery is something that we can do. And we gave some examples here. These are not supposed to be all encompassing. Indeed, a physiotherapist in the team is uh, definitely recommended to, to help with uh, exercises. But you can see there's some abdominal, pelvic tilting exercises and knee rolling exercises that may well um, assist that we found in the literature as we went through. Next slide, please. And then recommendation 4.1, assess the quality of life with focus of, on psychological distress and self-identity, which can be found on page 48. Of course, as we, uh, we help someone through the surgical process of, of uh, body changing, life altering uh, surgery, um, it's important to recognize that you know, people do have psychological distress with any alteration in, in their perception of their own body, and it does um, definitely affect their own self-identity. And so uh, the group felt the strength of this recommendation was strong. Um, certainly the literature reports that there is an, an impact on mental health, uh, on self-identity, particularly sexuality and body image are described in the literature. And uh, as Kim mentioned, these things are maybe not often talked about, but definitely maybe some of the things that are disturbing people the most and should be talked about. So practice notes. Ongoing assessment needed. Maybe somebody's dealing with something okay today, and then in a few days when they get home, maybe things change when they interact with their family more, when they go back to work. This changes how um, they're perceiving themselves and, and see themselves in the world with this new body. Um, to try and figure out, you know, how people are coping, you can do things like use validated tools or use open ended questions to encourage people to speak and give them permission to speak because sometimes people don't, uh, don't feel that they have necessarily an open ear to talk to when they need one. And provide education, counseling, and referrals for further support. And the education can include partners and family if the patient wishes. Next slide, please. So 
Going on with practice notes, some examples of open-ended questions might be before surgery, how do you expect your life to change after surgery? How are you thinking that this surgery will impact you? Have you thought this through? Uh, what are your greatest concerns regarding your upcoming surgery? Often people will start to, to talk a little bit about some of those things. After surgery, very important to continue the conversation because now it's real. Have you had any concerns with your ostomy since surgery? What, what new things have cropped up that maybe you didn't even imagine? Do you have a good support system in place to help you manage, manage your changes? What strategies do you have in place? Uh, do you feel an increase in anxiety in social environments since your surgery? And I think it's important when you ask these questions, these open-ended questions, to make sure that the person feels in a safe space, that it's, you know, it's maybe normal to feel a degree of anxiety. That's not any kind of failure, but it's good to talk about it and so that you can find ways with others to, to form strategies that can help you through the process. Next slide, please. So hello everyone, this is Grishma again, and thank you so much Kim and Christine um, for going over the recommendations. Um, we just really wanna say that without your insights and support, we this developing the recommendations would not have been possible. So a big, huge thank you um, from our NAO. And um, so within the guideline, um, following the recommendation statements, we have um, the appendices, that's what you'll see. And in the next few slides, I'll go over the key appendices um, that you'll find within the guideline. So the appendices we have include useful tools or guides for clinicians, as well as for persons anticipating or living with ostomies. And the source from which they're adapted or modified are indicated at the end of each appendix, if you would like to refer to that. Um, so again, what you see on the slides are a snippet of um, a portion of the appendices, and please refer to the guideline for getting complete details. So on this slide here, what you see is Appendix H, and it outlines the assessment terms, parameters, definition, and definitions for different types of ostomies. And it also includes pictures that shows various stoma complications and uh, their descriptions. And Appendix J here is another example, which includes sample ostomy teaching record that, that nurses can use to provide pre- and post-operative teaching pertaining to management of ostomy for individuals during their stay at the hospital. And this ostomy teaching record reflects our findings from the evidence and has been updated to include them. And he, we have another example, Appendix L. This is an example of a personal checklist specifically for persons anticipating or living with an ostomy. This is a very useful tool for persons to use preoperatively, postoperatively, and after discharge regarding self-management, potential complications, and follow-up care. Another appendix that you'll find in the guideline, um, it doesn't mention which appendix it is, but it is Appendix C on education statements. This um, document was developed by the RNAO Guideline Development and Research Team. This document is based on an analysis of educational recommendations across several BPGs on diverse clinical topics and populations. This document outlines standard educational strategies that health service organizations as well as academic institutions can use to support the implementation of evidence-based recommendations from clinical guidelines within their respective settings. So for example, this ostomy BPG, it, it did not have a recommendation question specific to education strategies that academic institutions or health organizations could use to implement the guideline. Therefore, this education statements document will serve as a supplement. And again, in addition to the specific appendices that we um, just mentioned previously, the, um, this best practice guideline also include appendices on nutritional management tips, resources to promote patient education, self-management, financial resources, ostomy-related organizations, and charter of ostomies rights. Thank you, Krishna. This is uh, Napsen speaking again. So aside from the appendices, um, the, in the guideline, we also have guideline evaluation measures, which are specific to each recommendation. So if you are an organization implementing this BPG and want to know the impact of the recommendation on practice change on patient outcomes, you can use the measures outlined in these charts to monitor for success or help you to identify areas that may require further change. 
Uh, these measures were developed with the panel and also received internal and external feedback, meaning that these measures have been validated. So on page 96 of the guideline, there is a detailed flow chart of the development of these measures. And um, these, uh, this evaluation and monitoring chart was really, um, the lead was taken on by our evaluation team, also known as our NPAR team. Um, so what next? So after you have guided, read this guideline, or now that you know this guideline, you're perhaps asking yourself, what can I do beyond reading this guideline? So I'd just like to share with you how RMEO can help you use this guideline to its full potential. So at RNEO, when we develop guidelines, our intention is to support the uptake of guidelines into practice through supporting dissemination and implementation. And we do this through a variety of ways. Some examples include hosting webinars, workshops, uh, conferences, institutes, and other avenues to spread knowledge. Additionally, we also have uh, evaluation metrics, like I mentioned uh, a few moments ago, uh, so that organizations can know the impact uh, of the guideline is having on persons, providers, organizations, and systems. So uh, on this slide here, there's a few resources that can help you implement this guideline in your practice if you so wish. So we, we encourage you to read the guideline, which is available for free online or a hard copy that can be ordered. I know today we did a very high level overview of the guideline, but we hope that you'll take the time to read the guideline thoroughly, including some of the evidence in detail, the appendices and resources, and perhaps discuss its implications with your colleagues. You can also conduct a gap analysis, which is an activity to side by side compare what best practice is saying about Austin Care and how that may be similar or different to what is being done at your current practice. In instances where they do not align, perhaps this can help you highlight practice areas for your organization that may be of priority. And this gap analysis can also be downloaded on our website. In addition, uh, this summer we'll be publishing and making available a mobile app of this guideline, which will outline best practices and point of care resources to be used in frontline care. So please do look out for that. Given that the guideline is around 120 pages, we understand that it may not always be feasible to carry it with you in your practice. Thus, we'll be summarizing pertinent information that is accessible via the mobile app. So it's not really meant to be a replacement for the full guidelines. We do hope that you do read the full guideline as well. You can also become a best practice champion through our best practice champions network. So RNO has free e-learning courses, virtual learning series online, and also hosts in-person workshops that walk through processes and steps that it takes in order to take a guideline like the Austin guideline and put it into practice. Finally, we also have um, online our implementation toolkit, which walks through the systematic and planned steps of the knowledge to action framework. This again is another to tool to guide practice change. Um, so RNEO has in fact published many guidelines in a variety of topics. I just want to bring your, your attention to some specific guidelines that really go hand in hand with some of the key concepts within this guideline. So for instance, some of the evidence-based uh, practice notes in the uh, guideline outline the importance of persons caring for and demonstrating pouching system changes. Uh, so guidelines that you may also want to refer to um, to help facilitate self-management could be the facilitating client-centered learning best practice guideline or even the guideline on strategies and supporting self-management. Other complementary guidelines um, include developing and sustaining interprofessional health care as well as the person and family centered care. So if you are interested, please do check these guidelines out as well online and they are free for download. So that really um, concludes our uh, presentation part of our webinar today. Um, if you do have any uh, questions about the guideline in the future that perhaps we don't address today, please feel free to contact us. Uh, you can contact me personally through my email, or you can contact us through the RNA website using the contact us link. If you have any specific questions regarding the guideline evaluation measures, you can email the RNA evaluation and monitoring team. Uh, which is inquire at rno.ca. So uh, 
Before we proceed, I just wanted to acknowledge that this guideline was funded by the Ontario Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, and all work produced by RNA is editorially independent from its funding source. So uh, we do have um, quite some time to answer questions if you have any. I'm just gonna take a look at the chat box to see if there were any questions um, people had submitted. Um, so I just checked the chat, bo chat box and there were no questions from participants. However, at this point, if there are questions that um, you would like to speak out on, please do feel free to unmute yourself and uh, feel free to ask or if there's any comments, um, we would love to hear. Okay. Um, my apologies. I just learned that uh, from your end uh, with the Zoom platform, you are not able to unmute yourself. So maybe I'll just uh, open up the floor for any questions in the chat box. So uh, we have a question from J.M. Chap. Are there any recommendations for clinicians working in isolated First Nations in Northern Ontario? Um, so when we looked at the literature, we did not find any specific um, studies that identified um, interventions within Northern settings in particular. Um, how or um, in working with First Nations. Um, however, I think these guidelines, the, these recommendations are, are quite generalizable to the, those settings as well. Um, I'm not sure if Kim or Christine, you wanted to add anything to that? As Chris, I, I would uh, say that hopefully these guidelines will support um, your request for resources. I think the, the guidelines, the purpose of the guidelines is to set standards for people everywhere uh, anticipating or living with an ostomy. And it is recognized that there are remote areas that are underserviced. And I think hopefully this is uh, more ammunition for you to get what you need there. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's Kim, I, I agree with that, Chris. And I think that, you know, hopefully this document will give us some of the support we need, particularly in the remote areas, for governments to pay for the training of nurses to become on ENDS walks so that the patients can, can get the care that they need. Um, another question we had um, was, could telemedicine be helpful? Um, so within the literature, there was um, um, our nurses providing support through uh, the phone, and this was most mostly in the post discharge phase. Uh, one once one um, study in particular was providing um, post discharge follow up care and consultation for about a month, and there was both uh, quant uh, quantitative evidence, so pertaining to the outcomes that we looked at and improved outcomes, as well as qualitative evidence. So uh, persons receiving um, this sort of care actually commented that they felt that it was very useful for them and that they felt um, confident in uh, confiding in with the nurses and getting appropriate uh, referral or information on ostomy support. So um, there is some support in, ter in, in the use of a telephone, um, uh, tel telemedicine in the post-discharge phase. That's actually just specific to the recommendation 2.2 on ostomy care program. Just wanted to, if you want to just go back and look at um, that particular recommendation, mm -hmm. um, it's on for 2.2. Mm -hmm. and, and the study that I'm talking about is also outlined in the evidence profiles, which is the supplementary mm -hmm. material that we have posted online. Yeah. And one of the bullet points for 2.2 was scheduled home visits and telephone follow-up within the first four weeks. And there's more details if you'd like to look at that. Uh, we had uh, another question. Is there a quick reference for the guideline? Um, so we don't have a quick reference of the guideline in, in a hard copy. However, we do have a summary rec of recommendations table in the beginning of the guideline. So that's about um, uh, one to two pages that really um, 
has the only really the recommendations and the strength of those recommendations uh, in table format. So you can you are free to print that up online. And the app we will be publishing at, by the end of summer, so you will have access to that. And the app is free as well. Um, so there's another comment. Uh, I found that there are different approaches from dietitians. I have an ileostomy and have had varying input and suggestions. Um, so as this is a very uh, clinical question, I'm going to just pass it on to um, Kim and Christine to see if you have any remarks. Uh, it's Kim. Certainly, you know, different dietitians will have different opinions on things much the same way as, uh, you know, different ENSWOCs may have different opinions. One thing to keep in mind is that because ostomy surgeries in some areas aren't that common, um, Quite often, you know, we will get, if someone doesn't stay up to date with the literature, that can be an issue. And I think, you know, it's, it's important that we as ENSWOCs and uh, nurses stay up to date and that we work with the dietitians and remind them that the person does have an ileostomy or colostomy or urostomy, depending on their type of stoma, and advocate for our patients and make sure that the dietitian is aware and are giving the most up to date. I ran into a case not that long ago, it's not a dietitian, but with a pharmacist who, you know, substituted a, a medication for someone living in long-term care and substituted it to a capsule formula, uh, to a capsule pill when the individual had an ileostomy. And, you know, we, see, we started seeing behavioral changes and it came down to the fact that the person wasn't getting their medication to help control their aggression because it was switched to a capsule form and wasn't being digested. And the same kind of things can happen in the dietitian world. So I think it's very important that we work collaboratively with uh, our dietitian and that we make sure that they understand that the ins and outs of someone having, particularly an ileostomy. Yeah, I would agree with you, Kim, that um, certainly uh, different dietitians may have different background, different interests in ostomy, and, and certainly dietitians may have multiple areas of different focus, maybe diabetes, uh, pediatrics, all kinds of other things, and ostomy is one more thing, so we need to collaborate with them for sure. And then the other thing, of course, is that people do individually tend to um, react differently to different types of foods, whether or not you have an ostomy, some people tolerate things better than others and so forth. So the individual person also has to be considered in the whole equation. So uh, yeah, we have to work collaboratively. Um, thank you so much, for Kim and Christine. Uh, we also had a question from someone asking whether or not this was our first guideline using uh, GRADE. Um, so yes, it is our first guideline using GRADE and GRADE CIRCOL. So uh, we were very excited to be able to adapt this um, standard uh, guideline development, which is international, and our guidelines moving forward will all incorporate GRADE and GRADE CIRCOL. So you can anticipate um, seeing guidelines where we have more specific uh, specific recommendations similar to the guideline that um, is, isn't in this ostomy guideline. Um, so someone wrote, ENSWOC, as I understand it, can order continent supplies. Can non-insured health benefits be billed directly by ENSWOC, or does the community MD still need to be involved? Um, so uh, that is a question perhaps, Kim and Christine, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to pass that to you, if you, if you know the answer to that. There's been some changes of late to the non-insured health benefits and ENSWOCs are now listed as insurers for um, being able to authorize um, ostomy products. Chris, do you know about, I'm not sure if they added continents to that list or not, but for certainly for ostomy supplies, um, the ENSWOC can be an authorizer. Yeah, I, I'm going to say this is uh, this is uh, something in motion, um, and so stay tuned. Uh, it also depends on you know different areas and and so forth. So there's a lot of lot of moving parts to this, but stay tuned. And all I can say is it's getting better, and we hope to bring down some of those barriers. We're working on it. Thank you. Um, we have a question: Is there a way to safeguard patients from getting harmful help from untrained help within the system, or those who don't know about the guidelines? 
So I think that goes back to Kim and Christine's um, poignant fact, poignant point about um, advocacy, advocacy. And I think this is a first guideline to address the um, issue of access to NSWOC. As we know, there are tremendous benefits when persons living with an ostomy have direct access to NSWOC. So I think this is the first uh, sort of stepping stone in moving in that direction. And again, I think it goes back to advocacy. Um, if you yourself are living with an ostomy and feel that you are not getting the right services, you can also use this guideline as, uh, as evidence to perhaps show um, um, the organization that you're perhaps getting um, care from. Um, I'm, yeah, I would, I would also like to add that I was very, very excited that with this uh, guideline, we had a colorectal surgeon on the group, uh, Terry Zweep, and um, the Colorectal Surgeon Society, Canadian Society for Colon and Rectal Surgeons, are very well aware of this uh, guideline and this being the standard. And uh, so hopefully as people face the surgery right from day one, it will be understood that the... the standard is that people get uh, expert care from the beginning. So hopefully that is going to uh, impact, it's not, it's a nursing, um, it's a nursing uh, aim to have patients have better care, but it's also now coming from surgeons who are performing the surgery that they understand that there's a standard of care and that there needs to be a program in place. So uh, we're very excited about this collaboration. And we hope that's gonna make a difference. And I think that, you know, we as nurses need to advocate for the best care for our patients that we can. And, you know, may, ensuring that the patients know where they could go for expert help and that the, the nurses help guide them in that direction. And, you know, certainly we have to keep in mind that, you know, a lot of nurses, if they're not NSWOC, some of them have lots of great knowledge and that, you know, they've taken on a personal interest and learned a lot of things independently. But it's very important that the patients are getting a consistent message and that they receive the most up-to-date information. And I think that, you know, it, it is in the part of the Ostomy Bill of Rights that, uh, that the United Ostomy Association has put forth many years ago that every patient should have access to, uh, well, they call it ET nurse, stoma care nurse, or NSWOC. So... You know, I think it's very important that we help advocate for that and that we, um, you know, it, we can't control it um, so much in terms of if uh, someone's going out and misrepresenting themselves, but we just need to keep a consistent message that patients deserve the best care. Uh, thank you, Kim and Christine. Um, there's another question here. Um, asking, is there a lot of emphasis in the hospitals regarding prevention of peristomal hernias? I see more and more patients with peristomal hernias, and when asked if someone had talked to them regarding prevention, they will likely say no one. These poor patients, due to their abdominal pain changes, are suffering from frequent leakages, increase in nursing visits, and ostomy supplies. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, so because the panel actually... Uh, recognize this to be a priority area that there needs to be more guidance on because there seems to be a lack of people getting um, advice on how to prevent peristomal hernias. Therefore, we do have a key recommendation on prevent prevention strategies for peristomal hernia within the guideline. Um, however, whether, whether or not to what extent it is um, done within the hospital care setting, uh, I unfortunately cannot uh, speak to that. I'm not sure if Kim and Christine, you are able to. So, so I'm, I'm not going to speak to any particular hospital because I'm sure it, it varies throughout the country, but I think the idea of this guideline and this recommendation was to speak to that this should be included in, in that conversation. Certainly, it's a very, very, very common complication. We do know this. The literature says it's very, very, very common. You're going to put a hole in somebody's muscle. It's not surprising that's now a weak spot where extra bowel can poke through so uh it, it it's logically a um it's a complication that you would see happen frequently and it's pretty devastating when it happens because it really makes uh, fitting somebody properly without leakages much more complicated and it increases the cost of their their own care etc so we recognize this is a this is a big thing uh, there are some simple preventative measures that 
people can do, uh, should be aware of, and this should be talked about. Absolutely, we believe in every uh, circumstance after surgery. Uh, in, before surgery, if someone is know, knows that they're going to have the surgery, uh, just to anticipate that, they should know what the limitations are, what they can and can't do. Uh, they should have to search and check them to make sure they're healed enough when they start exercise and so forth. But it should be in every conversation. And uh, the recommendation is to support um, a good standard of care for everyone. So uh, hopefully it's going to be happening in every hospital now. Thank you, Christine. Um, so I'm just going to take the last question before we wrap up today. Um, we have a question. Do you think that many people within the healthcare system will purchase these very helpful guidelines? Will the guideline recommendations be used within their RN training? At least to, to some degree, I had had some very unhelpful gaps. So thank you so much for that question. Um, so within um, the RNAO implementation program, these guidelines are not necessarily mandated throughout Ontario. However, we do know that there is a lot of uptake of these guidelines. In particularly, we do work with um, organizations um, that sign up to be what we um, refer to as best practice um, spotlight organizations, um, which they sign a uh, like a three-year contract with us to uptake uh, particular guidelines. So it is if it is of interest to them and a priority for ostomy care, um, it is mandatory for them to implement this guideline um, as well as um, measure the impact of these guidelines on um, the care of their patients. Um, with that being said, uh, knowing that. Um, Really, the foundation to practice change oftentimes comes uh, um, is at the education level for providers. We acknowledge that at RNAO, and that's why we have developed those education statements so that um, it actually outlines all the strategies for both academic institutions as well as health organizations to um, uh, implement those guidelines within their respective settings. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So. Yeah, and our and guidelines our, yeah. are free of charge, so very accessible and um, uh, very Download, uh, downloadable for free. Yeah. So it do, doesn't necessarily have to be purchased. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mean, we're we're trying our best to disseminate this guideline. Um, and now that you know you've been able to hear from us during this webinar, we hope that you are also able to spread the word on our behalf. Thank you. Um, so I guess we will wrap up today. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. Uh, I think we had uh, a, lots of fruitful discussion. And um, again, I just wanted to emphasize that this BPG really outlines system and organizational level change that is necessary to provide persons living with an ostomy the best possible care, as well as key practice areas to facilitate optimal quality of life. So whether that be um, in terms of uh, someone's physical well-being as well as their emotional and psychological well-being. So uh, again, I just really wanted to thank the co-chairs from the bottom of my of my heart for hosting this webinar with us today, um, as well as their ongoing efforts as we disseminate this guideline. Uh, thank you to our expert panel members again for all their hard work on this guideline. I'd also like to thank the stakeholder reviewers if you are uh, listening in on today. Um, uh, thank you again, Grishma and Erica, for su uh, your support in uh, the webinar today. And thank you everyone who took the time off today to listen in. We will be publishing um, this uh, webinar and we will be posting it online. So thank you so much and have a great rest of the day.